Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 3. The Screwtape Letters. Preface. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where David, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we are eavesdropping on the correspondence of a senior demon screw tape as he explains how to tempt the patient, a human assigned to his nephew, a demon named Wormwood. Each week, we'll be considering a different letter, untwisting screw tape's hellish logic, and forming a battle plan for our own spiritual lives. And I'm excited. We're diving into the preface now. We are getting into the book. But before we do, it's always fun to catch up a little bit. What's everyone been reading in addition to screw tape? Uh, I'm just starting two sets of seminary classes. And so um, in the last couple of weeks, I've been reading New Testament. I've been reading homiletics, um, reading the Carol and Philip Zaleski book on the Inklings, um, and reading about romantic religion and been delighted to revisit the essays presented to Charles Williams. So we're reading Tolkien's on fairy stories. Lots of good stuff in there. It's reading every day for me now. I knew we shouldn't have let him go first. He's just going to make us look bad. <laughs> I was going to say, this is just a dumb question on my part because it, it, it's, it's, it shows the gap between what I bring and what, they, what Andrew brings. <laughs> okay. For pleasure reading, I'm rereading The Hunger Games because there's a new series um, about the background of snow. And so uh, I think it's called Serpents and Birds or something. And Kristen and I read that over the summer. So I'm slowly making my way for fun uh, through the Hunger Games. That makes me feel way better. Okay, that's good. Um, I don't know, way better, but better. Uh, Ah. So the wife and I, we are reading through the Bible in a year. So we're doing that each day. Uh, We are also reading Fahrenheit 451. Mm Mm-hmm which is one of those dystopian books. I read pretty much all of the others in high school, 1984, Animal Farm, Brave New World. This was one that I hadn't, and someone at Marie's work had recommended Fahrenheit 451. So we're about a third of the way through that. For the upcoming interview with James Comel, I'm rereading his book, C.S. Lewis, A Very Short Introduction. And... On Audible at the moment, I am listening to Atheist Delusions by David Bentley Hart. I haven't read much of his stuff before, but uh, I, I know his, his, his catalogue is, is, is pretty broad and enough of my friends have said that he's worth checking out. And so far, it's really good. I am reading. Actually, if you re- realize mine aren't so bad. <laughs> um, you know, no, no, Matt, Matt, what Spot did next is a critical, important part of the Western canon. You'd be <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> well, that, that's, I'm going to finish with that. But, um, wow. I've got three books going on right now. And the first one is Timothy Keller, The Meaning of Marriage. And I'm very excited for that. As a single person, it's always good to have that realization when you're fighting the narrative the world tells you to, as, as you're looking for a future spouse. I'm reading The Color of Law. Uh, I try to understand modern day political stuff from time to time, and a friend recommended that. And so she's reading a book I gave her, and I am reading that book. And then The Navarre Bible. That's the big thing that's just come across my radar, I guess. I'm starting a Bible study on Wednesday nights, and I'm getting hooked to it. Hooked to it. It's essentially got two verses on a page, and then the rest of the page is commentary from either Augustine, Aquinas... And from our tradition, different um, Catholic councils, and just helps explain how this fits into the bigger theological scope. And I'm just getting absorbed into it. I think it was put together by Saint Jose Maria Jose Maria Escriva. Was if I've heard, oh. if I remember that correctly, commissioned that. That's the founder of Opus Dei. Oh, okay, okay, there you go. So I I will fit every stereotype. I used to be real. I used to read scripture all the time, and we went to a uh, um, a Protestant high school. Loved it. Had an incredible discipleship teacher. And then I got really into theology and kind of away from scripture, which is dangerous. <laughs> and uh, that was. And now as a, as a Catholic, I'm coming back to scripture in a big way and I'm loving reading it, loving diving in. I read 30 minutes in the morning and I'm reading for hours in the evening, this Navarre Bible. Okay. Well, you know, I, I'm going to have to bring out the big guns. This is my fourth or fifth year in a row uh, of reading through the Bible in a year. Um, and so I've got the chronological Bible. And my wife um, suggested that uh, reading a different translation than the one that you know can make the verses kind of jump out. So mm-hmm. I've made my way through just about every translation they have in the Bible in a year, um, which is Old Testament, New Testament, and then Psalm and Proverb every day. 
So this year I'm reading in the New King James Version, which is quite fun. Okay. Um, but then I've decided to move the news apps to the very far last page on my phone and try not to read the news because not much of it is edifying. And a friend of mine gave me this handwritten, uh, it, it's copied, but it was is done by, uh, by Swanee, uh, handwritten uh, uh, Psalter. And so on one page, it's got the Coverdale Psalms, uh, which were in the Book of Common Prayer for, for mm. uh, centuries. And then on the, uh, the facing page, it's got the Vulgate of the Psalms. And so I'm trying to read the daily portion of the Psalms in Latin, which is a little rusty for me. But, uh, but that is a good alternative to, to paying attention to what I see on the news. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did something very similar. I had a bilingual Bible when I was learning Spanish. Yeah. So I would typically read the Psalms in Spanish. And one of the nice things is the vocabulary in the Psalms is relatively limited and quite repeated. Yeah. So you get quite used to what, uh, the, the words that come up. Well, and that's actually something that Lewis suggested to learners of language, that they read the Bible in their new language, because if you're familiar with it, um, you know how to expect some of what's coming up. Well, listeners from this pre-episode chit-chat can take away one big thing. We are all deeply steeped in scripture right now. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> Long may it last. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Let's go with the quote of the week. And this week it is going to be pulled, of course, from the text, the screw tape letters, indirectly from the preface. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased with both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Hmm. I'm going to talk about this later, but I fall into the camp of sometimes fearing Satan's power a little bit too much. You know, there's a point where you want to respect that these are temptations coming at you, but with God's grace and his abundance, you shouldn't fear it. But I, I, I do sometimes that's getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. And that's the Martin Luther quote, right? About laughing at the enemy. We're going to talk about that, right? Yep. So, before we jump into that, as always, guys, the drink of the week. And this week, we are doing the, which I know I said, Andrew, we're going to have you take this over. Next time, we're going to have you take this over. But the drink of the week is the same <laughs> brand. It's the Balvenie. But this, we got a little kit with a few different ones from the, the company. And so, it's going to be the Balvenie 12 year. So, same double wooded single malt, except rather than a 17 year, it's a 12 year. So we're going to see what kind of impact and difference this makes. So before we smell, what we should be smelling is sweet fruit and Oloroso sherry notes layered with honey and vanilla. So for the reminder guys, last week, the honey and the vanilla was very present in the 17, but there's no green apple. So let's see if we don't notice that. Well, and then in the Michael Jackson, um, uh, complete guide to single malt, uh, it describes this Balvini double wood 12 year old as first and second fill bourbon casks, then six to 12 months in sweet Oloroso casks. So there's your Oloroso sherry. Uh, the color is amber, which looks pretty true. And the nose is sherry and orange skins. Mm. Getting any orange? I can definitely taste in? something citrusy. Yes, you're right. The, the sweet fruit does come across. I don't yeah. know what a sherry note is. So to be honest, I can't claim that, but I can still get the honey and vanilla a little bit more subtle though than the last. And I do get that citrus. You've never tried sherry before? No, I don't even know what to think of it. Oh, sherry is delicious. We're barbarian knuckle draggers from America. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the nose. Now let's go, let me read the taste and we're all going to take a drink here. Smooth and mellow. I'm excited to try that. With beautifully combined flavors. And so a nutty sweetness, cinnamon spiciness, and delicately proportioned layer of sherry. So a mm. cinnamon, a sherry, and a sweetness, a nutty sweetness. Let's see. And this says the medium rich body and beautifully combined mellow flavors, nutty, sweet, sherry. All right. Mm, I can definitely taste the sherry at the sides of my mouth. And Andrew, is there anything we should know? It, do you swish it around? Do you leave it on your tongue? Are there any techniques once you put it in your mouth? Um, I'll sometimes open my mouth and breathe in a little bit. But that's mostly for the nose. But yeah, I just let it linger a little bit. So I got a 
a, mm. a bit of that. You can tell that that's not as old as the 17 that we had. Yes, it's so not as smooth. You can. <laughs> it burns a little more on the back of my tongue. Steve had me to stay once. Um, he once handed me a, a seven British first editions of the Chronicles of Narnia, and I opened a up, and somebody had scribbled all over the maps. I'm like, who would dare scribble all over the maps? It was Pauline Baines. These were her <laughs> copies, the illustrator. We AB'd an 18-year-old and a 21-year-old. And the 21-year-old scotch just almost evaporated before you even drank it. Mm. <laughs> All right, now tasting with the water. It'd be so amazing if I could identify some single ones of Macallan 25. And for a closure of a season, I bet they would be like $100 a single one. But man, it would be worth a taste. Mm. Boy, that mm. water really kind of unifies. It binds just one drop, but it binds the whole... A whole mouth together. It's got quite a long finish. Mm -hmm. So this time we're going to toast all of our gold level supporters on Patreon. And so let's raise a glass to our Patreons for giving of their time, treasure, and talent. Treasure, obviously, for supporting this ministry so beautifully. We appreciate it so much. Your talent. So many of you either on Slack contribute to the conversation and so many of you outside of through email ask us questions and contribute thoughts. We are so appreciative of that. That just hones in our ability to do this even better. And finally, your time. Just from participating in the Slack community to even listening to the episodes, that helps spread this, that helps share it, that helps increase the subscribers, which helps attract more people. So we just thank you for all of that. So cheers to you all. Cheers. Water really takes away the burn. Just a, I, I did. I did two drops. Well, I, I love what you said about uh, choosing to our to our supporters, and uh, I've done. Your listeners may know that I do a reading every week uh, on Saturdays at one Eastern time of a chapter of Till We Have Faces, and then we talk about it on my Facebook author page. Um, but then lately, I've been. Uh, starting to kind of get together what I'm informally calling the Drinklings. It was a name I immediately wanted to steal. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. I wish it were original to me. But uh, we get together um, maybe a couple times a month on a Thursday night, and Brittany White has been in there and a number of others. And it, uh, I set it up as kind of a and a but what it really turns into is a meeting of the Inklings, a meeting of the like-minded. And I remember the first time I visited the Wade Center to do research, and I tried to explain the importance of this or that to uh, to the archivist. And they're like, yes, yeah, that table that you're talking about, we have it right here. <laughs> um, and the feeling when you meet somebody who loves Lewis, that you're finally not alone. It's, you know, what Lewis says about that friendship is to feel, oh, yes, you love these things too. And so the the Pints of the Jack folks um, and, the, the, and the supporters have been such a blessing to make me not feel like I'm completely strange and alone <laughs> in the love that I have for these things. So here's to you. And a reminder, we're just beginning. David's got 18 seasons yeah. mapped out, so imagine how big the community can be in 18 years. <laughs> I'll be done with my Episcopal ministry. <laughs> my goal is for us to take you through to retirement. Okay, good. <laughs> But speaking about not being alone, I had a lovely parcel arrive at my home this week. And it was from Matt via Andrew with a few bonus gifts included. So Matt asked uh, Andrew to send me a first American edition of Till We Have Faces. Uh, so I can read that to my wife so she knows how much I love her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew also, you included... Uh, a, a prayer card from the installment, I guess you'd call it, the installment of Lewis in Westminster Cathedral. Because when you went there, you took a few extras. <laughs> it was actually, a, it's actually an abbey. Oh, sorry. It, it's it's the Catholic in me. There's the Westminster <laughs> Cathedral is where the Catholics go. Westminster Abbey. That used to be ours. Yes, <laughs> yes that used to be yours. Yeah. Before Henry got his, his hands on it. Um uh, the chair that William the Conqueror was uh, was was uh, enthroned in is is there, but yes, it was such a blessing to be there. November twenty second, or twenty thirteen, fifty years to the day after Lewis's death, and Michael Ward's efforts uh, finally proved fruitful, and they installed a, a stone, a memorial stone, at Westminster Abbey. Um, 
people like our esteemed guest, Holly Ordway, and others had the really nice seats in the choir. And so I just went around <laughs> to the punter's seats. But I ended up sitting right directly behind Douglas Gresham <laughs> and in the second row, 10 feet away from the stone. And so I got a, a wonderful view that day. Um, but I knew that there were many who weren't able to to make it. Um, and so I knelt in front of a, an icon of the Virgin and I lit a candle for all of you all who love Lewis, mm -hmm. but weren't able to be there that day. And then I took an ungodly <laughs> stack of prayer cards um, from from the uh, from the candle uh, station there, and I pass them out when I meet somebody who is one of us. And and I know David is itching to get into the episode, so I don't. This will be very brief, but we did that because David. You, I mentioned this a lot, so this isn't news, but sometimes I don't do it as intentionally. David does an insane amount of work with his podcast. He is this season particularly. He has scripted out the entire thing. He drives it. This wouldn't happen without his driving force. And I knew he really enjoyed the Till We Have Faces book. So when Andrew mentioned he had a first edition, I was thinking to myself, well, I didn't really, Till We Have Faces isn't my favorite Lewis book. But I was like, you know, David and Marie really love this book. Um, and they read mm. it together. And so it was a gift because of David's effort he puts into this. I mean, he puts an insane amount of his time, obviously his treasure and his talent too. But so we thank you for that, David. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, Andrew also included some stones. And I knew what they were even before I opened the card and read the description. <laughs> uh, one comes from Addison's Walk and the other comes from the Kilns because Andrew likes stealing stones from places that he's visiting. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Um, there, There's a particular rust-colored stone on Addison's Walk. And so every time I'm privileged to go over there, I take a little baggie with me. And I uh, swipe a bunch of Addison's rocks, uh, I'd like to call them. I love that. Uh, Jerry Root says that he's carried off enough brick from the kilns. Um, it's just there in the garden beds, uh, the flower beds, <laughs> that he could probably build his own kilns. Uh, but I knew I wasn't that weird when Jerry, one day while I was visiting him, uh, gave me a stone, uh, a little brick shard from Leatherhead Station where Lewis first bought Fantasties. And so I mm -hmm. uh, wanted you to have those. I carry an Addison's Rock with me uh, in my pocket everywhere I go. Um, not so much to be a fangirl of Lewis, but a uh, fanboy. But uh, the what happened was he took a walk with Tolkien and, uh, and Hugo Dyson. And their talk on Addison's Walk about the things they loved changed the world. And for me, it's not so much a symbol of fandom of Lewis, but a, a symbol of the friendship um, that can be so deeply important. And it brings us, I think, around to the beginning of this book, which is dedicated to J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> Before we get to that dedication, because we're going to talk about that, David, how about the 100-word summary? Yes. As we mentioned in the previous episode, in the past, we've done 150 words. But since these chapters are a little smaller, I also shrunk the word limit just to give me a little bit of a challenge. So here we go. There are multiple prefaces to the Screwtape Letters, but the most commonly found is from 1941. In this short preface, Lewis declares that he's not going to tell us how he obtained these letters from Screwtape. He then identifies two mistakes people often make when it comes to the devils. Complete disbelief and excessive fascination both in which the devils delight. As well as explaining that there are some disconnects in the chronology of the letters, Lewis reminds the reader that the devil is a liar and we can't trust anything Screwtape says, even from his own hellish point of view. All right, listeners, a quick little aside. You don't know this, but there's a week between what you just heard five seconds ago and what you're hearing right now. We had to stop due to some unforeseen travel circumstances that popped up on my part up at a cabin leaving last minute. We wanted to let you know that rather than just jump right into it, because in the time being, we have gotten a huge upgrade of a microphone for Andrew. So if his sound sounds different, that's why. We just didn't want you to go crazy. Well, and here I am. So I may or may not have switched up my scotch, but uh, <laughs> but I'm back with you all, and hopefully you can hear me a little bit better. I love it. And thank you, Patreon supporters, because it's because you guys do this, we can now hear Andrew. <laughs> well, cheers. <laughs> I'm lifting a glass I in that direction it. for sure. So let's jump in. So this is we're going to the preface, and the beginning, it starts out with a dedication to J.R.R. Tolkien, which... 
We've learned a lot about actually from Tolkien Month. If you guys listen to the Dr. Diana Glyer interview, she shared a lot about Tolkien and Lewis's influence on each other. So you guys know a lot about this. But am I correct to say, uh, Andrew, David, that Tolkien didn't love the screw tape letters? Uh, you know what? I don't know if I, uh, I'm not exactly sure how he responded precisely to the Tolkien letters. Increasingly, especially as he gets older, Tolkien doesn't like anything that's not <laughs> Tolkien. <laughs> so, would you say that's a true statement, David? I've heard it said a lot. I haven't read any of his letters where he specifically talks about it. But as you say, he seems to be repeatedly saying that he generally doesn't like a whole lot of stuff. I think he describes himself as a man of narrow tastes. And it seems that that only increased as he got older. Yeah, it's absolutely true. There's a, the, there's actually a letter from Lewis to Tolkien, or from Tolkien to Lewis, and he says, um, you're a born reader and a born critic. I, you read too much. I read too little. Um, and I was talking once with Walter Hooper about Tolkien and uh, whether or not he liked uh, the the Chronicles of Narnia, because famously he says, oh, well, it's terrible. It's got all the different mythologies in there. And I'm like, well, duh, you were the one who inspired that view <laughs> in Lewis. Um, but what Walter told me, which was really sweet, is that when he would go over to the house, he would see a copy of the Chronicles of Narnia and he and Edith reading the, the Narnia books to the grandchildren. And so there must have been something uh, in there that uh, that Tolkien liked. I also heard that he would buy them for children and godchildren in general. So he seemed to understand that other people appreciated them, even if he didn't. There is a little kind of contrasistency with uh, with Tolkien. You, you can take what he says, maybe with a grain of salt. And do you wonder if there was a reason Lewis dedicated to Tolkien other than just he thought, oh, it's a new book and I want to dedicate it to my friend. I'm curious if there's anything in here, the screw tape letters or something about this that made him think, I'm going to dedicate this to Tolkien. Like, I'm just curious. Is there anything in the screw tape letters that you can think of that he would be, Tolkien would be in the back of his mind as he was writing this? The only thing I can think of is there are repeated conversations in Screwtape about language mm. and about the philological mm. arm in hell and the work that they have been doing. And so I assume mm. at least that Lewis would guess that Tolkien would like those parts. Uh, if what we were told that he didn't like the Screwtape letters is true, I think probably if it had only been about how, how Screwtape messes with language, Tolkien might have liked it a little bit more. Well, and I also think, um, I, I take it as a as a gesture of affection, and I would be really surprised if Tolkien didn't receive it as such. The thing about the Inklings is that they were very combative. These were not necessarily sporty men, uh, but their competition often was, uh, was in their writings. And um, I've heard it described, they went at each other hammer and tongs, and they really kind of tore each other's work apart. And so I think that even Tolkien's disapproval, had it been there, would have been instructive to Lewis uh, in, in a similar way to the way that Lewis would object to some of the things Tolkien would do and Tolkien would, would make some changes. And so, and I was just doing some research before the show about um, Lewis dedicating a lot of the books in the 40s to the Inklings. And so this is Lewis's, I think, in some ways most popular book and certainly the book that put him on the map um, I'm going to go ahead and take it as a compliment that he would dedicate it to his friend Tolkien and maybe a sign that their friendship had grown from where it was maybe 10 years earlier. Good, good explanations. I've put you guys on the spot there. I like it. We also have here not only dedication, but we've got a couple quotations. That I'm curious your guys' thoughts on, but the first one is from Luther. The best way to drive out the devil, if he will not yield to texts of scripture, is to jeer and flout him, for he cannot bear scorn. And the other one is Thomas More. The devil, the proud spirit, cannot endure to be mocked. So both of these are about mocking and jeering, although with the Luther, after using scripture first to counter. And I, I interpret that somewhat as, at least in my own life, you're countering Satan, who's the enemy. He's instilling lies into you of who you are and to your worth as a person. Counter that with truth. But if you can't do that, you know what? Make, <laughs> make fun of him. <laughs> <laughs> Because he who lives in me is greater than he who is in the world. There's, there's, there's a confidence that Christians should have uh, that both Luther and Moore are, are, are speaking to. And what's lovely about this is Lewis has got a, both a Catholic and a Protestant talking about the devil who is 
their common enemy and against whom mm. they must be united. Whoa, didn't see that. I mean, I knew the Catholic and the Protestant didn't put it together like there that united are the common enemy. Well done, David. And in some ways, I think it's that unity that, uh, that, the de- that the devil hates as well. I mean, I think the devil hates friendship. The devil, as Matt and I are going to talk about, um, love is such a center to, to Lewis's work, and the devil hates any kind of love. And so here is this friendship love. And one of the things that the patient is struggling with is his loves, his love for his churchman, his love for his fiance, certainly his love for his mother. Now, granted, I think that everything kind of centers on till we have faces. But what I mean by that is that it centers on love. And you can see screw tape as uh, perhaps a, a, a series of uh, successful and failed loves. And the, the devil wants us not to love. Uh, and I think that that's a lot of what's going on in, here in Screw Tape. You know what I love? Bring it back to Till We Have Faces. What a surprise. <laughs> I know. I was just going to say, David and I bring it back to the great divorce constantly. And now we have Andrew who will bring it back to Till We Have Faces. It's a perfect blend. <laughs> that, that's because the great divorce is fully completed in Till We Have Faces. And we should all play a drinking game every time I mention <laughs> that maddening I love uh, novel. No, no, no. I have other stuff I got to do today. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so now we've spoken about the dedication and the quotations. Let's let's talk about the prefaces themselves because there are prefaces. Uh, there are mm. two main prefaces that you'll likely find in your copy of the Screwtape Letters. Uh, most likely the original preface from 1942, which is a good deal shorter, and a longer preface that he wrote in 61, and some versions include both or one or the other. And Lewis explains the difference between these two prefaces in a letter that he wrote to his publisher, Jocelyn Gibb. He says, the 1960 preface is me speaking in my own person and giving literal autobiographical facts. The 1941 is part of the fantasy or convention which the letters employ, spoken by the imaginary CSL, who has somehow tapped a diabolical correspondence. So what I wanted to do in this episode is pull apart the preface written in 1942 and then the one written in 61, because there's so much stuff packed into here that will help us understand this book as we go through it. So in the 42 preface, he begins it like this. I have no intention of explaining how the correspondence which I now offer to the public fell into my hands. So here we see, as Lewis said in his letter to Jocelyn Gibbs, the fantasy has already begun. Lewis is, he's playing along. He is putting himself into the story and asking us to believe that these are real letters that he's found. And there's going to be a really interesting twist to this when I speak about the handwritten version of this preface a little later. But this reminds me of movies like Fargo, that at the beginning they tell you that this is based on real life events. And it's not. It's pure fiction. But it's used as, as, uh, as a device to draw you into the story. I mean, I think that's fair. When you, when you watch a movie and it says at the beginning, based on real life events, I, I don't know about you, but I, I sit up, I pay attention. It's like, oh, this actually happened. And it, it sucks me in some more. Well, and I don't want to tip your hand too much, but doesn't Lewis uh, kind of put himself into another book that he was writing right around this time? He does indeed. <laughs> we, we will have to talk about that at the time. <laughs> I just love too that true. it gives you this sense that you are a fly on a wall privy to a conversation you are not supposed to be hearing. And there's an allure to that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And also a type of, it almost gives you a sense that you're getting insider information, which I work in the stock market. It's like, I've got insider information. This is valuable. It's, it also brings up something that I think it's worth knowing about Lewis is that there are times when he's not, how to say it, um, he's kind of misdirecting in some of his prefaces. Uh, very often he'll say, I've tried to write this book in such a way so that people who wouldn't like such a book can, can see that what kind of book it is and just waste as little time as possible and set it down. Right. You know, he's, um, or in the preface to problem of pain, he says, any real theologian will find out what and how little I've read, um, mere Christianity. You know, I'm a very ordinary layman in the church of England. Yes. I know that many ordinary laymen in the church of England are constantly called upon by the archbishop of Canterbury to be <laughs> part of committees and things. And so there's a little bit of disingenuousness, I think in a lot of the prefaces. And some of that I think has to do with just the twinkle. I think that Lewis is playing with people and, uh, and Doug Gresham once told me that the sound 
uh, that most of the biographers miss about Lewis's life is the consistent sound of laughter in his house. Mm. And so I think there was a lot of joking around. And I think that this is a little bit of, of Lewis joking, joking around a little bit. We may have talked about that in the interview I did yesterday. But I will leave that, <laughs> listeners, for about three months from now. <laughs> oh, wonderful. It's a little sooner than that. Okay, good. So in this preface, he tells us that he's discovered these letters. He's not going to tell us how. He makes an interesting note about the chronology could be different uh, between uh, the dating of the letters and what he calls terrestrial time, which is rather cute because it's rather like Narnia, that time is a little different. Mm-hmm. And, and then he gives us two warnings. He says the first is this. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. And this is something that we're going to see throughout the Screwtape letters. Screwtape loves extremes, all extremes except one. And I'm not going to tell you what that extreme is. We'll, we will discover it soon enough. But he loves extremes because they're much easier to exploit. And these are two extremes that Lewis himself fell into in his life. If you read Surprised by Joy, you find that he had both an interest in the occult. And there was also a time when he was basically denied the supernatural. So he was both a materialist and a magician, uh, one after the other. It was during his, uh, it was before he became a Christian too, that he had a chance to meet William Butler Yeats, who later features as the magician in Dimer. Uh, and so magic is certainly something that he was interested in. Uh, he was kind of a straight materialist. What you say is what you get. But when that wasn't satisfying for him, he would uh, veer off into, into fantasies of magic and uh, other kinds of fantasies that were perhaps a little bit more physical of nature. Yes, and not quite so family friendly, maybe. When I was reading that, my my danger is to think of the devil stronger than they are, or to think of the devil more powerful mm-hmm. than God. Sometimes, and I was reminded of I'm doing that Navar Bible study in Ephesians one and kind of First Peter two four, and this brings you back to Lewis on theosis. But we are adopted sons of God, and with that, we partake in a divine nature, and through the blood of the Lamb, we're freed from sin. I've been in a part of life where I feel certain sins and vices and stuff are having a hold of me. And I feel like Satan's got me, but that's not what you should think because God's grace is way more powerful than that. So as long as I, I can't remember what it is. Satan is only strong when I let him be. Someone said something like that before, but when I mm. turn to Christ and let him come to me, Satan's weak. And it's just a reminder too. I have, that's my problem. Oh, sure. Years ago in a class on Romans, uh, my professor described it as Satan being a captain on a ship who has been stripped of his rank. Um, but if he comes up to you and orders you around, you are still going to want to kind of mm-hmm. follow his orders because <laughs> we're accustomed to that. But that captain has been deposed. His uh, stripes have been stripped. And uh, and of course, Christ is now our captain. But the old one's going to keep coming <laughs> around and trying to get his way. I like that. I love it. The second warning that Lewis gives us is this. Readers are advised to remember that the devil is a liar. Not everything that Screwtape says should be assumed to be true, even from his own angle. There is wishful thinking in hell, as well as on earth. And this is really important, and I'm going to get on my soapbox for two minutes. People often ignore Lewis's prefaces, and it drives me crazy, because they do it at their peril. The number of people who have confidently told me that the Great Divorce communicates Lewis's views about the afterlife, yet he explicitly says that they're not. He explicitly denies it in the preface. And so here, I think this is another very important thing to really think through as we, as we work through the book. Everything that we're going to be encountering is twisted. It might not be true, even from his own point of view. It's certainly true. And, you know, I've faced a lot of discussions about whether or not Lewis was sexist. And you see some sexist language in, in several of his writings, including in Narnia. But you've got to pay attention to who's speaking. Mm. If Rabidash, the, the ridiculous is being sexist, then Lewis is subtly lampooning that same sexism, you know, or when, when Eustace or uh, Edmund says, well, isn't it an extraordinary thing about girls that they can never keep a map in their heads (laughs) when he himself doesn't know the way to go. And Lucy snaps right back and it's, she says, because we have something in them. (laughs) And so if something is being said, ridiculous, uh, something ridiculous is being said, 
it's up to us to kind of consider the source. And as in so much of Lewis's writing, and Orwell is kind of the perfect narrator too, who does this. You have to take what she says, you have to take what Screwtape says, and flip it right side up in order to get healthy advice. And part of that, I think, is just Lewis's Lewis's effort in helping us to see things clearly by sharpening our, sharpening our mental focus. A while ago on Facebook, I saw someone share uh, a, a scripture quote, you know, one of those inspirational graphics it said something <laughs> like, worship me and I will give you the world. And I saw people sharing it. It's like, wait a minute, I know that reference. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds uplifting until you check who said it, because it's during the temptations in the desert, and it's what Satan says to Jesus. So, yeah, you, you can't always believe everything you read. <laughs> Especially on the internet. <laughs> Especially on the internet. Abraham Lincoln warned us about this. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> well, and our friend, uh, our friend William O'Flaherty has made us something of a cottage industry in debunking some of the, the false quotes by Lewis. And I look forward to our conversation with him later on this season. Absolutely. But now I want to talk about the handwritten 42 preface. Oh, here's where it gets good. Because as is often noted, Lewis wrote his books like screw tape by hand and he used a dip pen. And then someone typically Warney, would then type out the handwritten manuscript on the typewriter. And then Lewis, I can't understand it still, but he would typically burn the handwritten manuscript. He would use the paper to light his pipe or fires in the winter. However, when he wrote this book, the blitz was going on. And so he was worried that the air raids might destroy the one and only screw tape manuscript. And so he therefore sent, among others, a, a copy to Sister Penelope, who was an Anglican nun at the community of St. Mary the Virgin in Wantage, which incidentally is about half an hour away from where I grew up. Mm. Uh, and, and actually, while, while we're talking about Sister Penelope, uh, I checked with Andrew on this because I'd heard this mentioned a few times and he actually dug out the reference to confirm that it's actually true. Lewis later dedicated Perilandra to Sister Penelope's convent. And so if you actually flip open your copy of Perilandra, you'll see the dedication says, to some ladies at Wantage. Now, what's funny is that when Perilandra was translated into Portuguese, the translator misunderstood it. And so he instead rendered it as to some wanton women. <laughs> <laughs> Which fortunately they found rather hilarious. <laughs> That's great. I think it's also, it's really helpful. One of the things that 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 one of the hallmarks of my scholarship is is looking at the chronology. And so to take screw tape and Paralandra kind of together is not at all a bad idea. And we've mentioned it a little bit before, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again. He also writes Preface to Paradise Lost uh, around this time and uh, does screw, or does mere, the broadcasts that become mere Christianity. But in terms of his writing, especially his kind of fantastical writing, screw tape letters and Paralandra are kind of worth thinking about in more or less the same breath. And so to, uh, to dedicate a book um, where there's some demon possession to the ladies at Wantage, there's, there's, a, there's some, some similar spirit going on. This explains why that essay that I sent, well, I sent you guys that little quote from the essay where it mentioned that someone thought Lewis's scholarship wasn't very good, if you remember that, like a week ago. But it went into Screwtape Letters, Paralandra, and Preface to Paradise Lost, and it, collect, it connected them all. And... Voyage of Dawn Treader or Magician's nephew, nephew. But anyways, it, it brought them together. So maybe that's the reason why it brought Paraland John Screw Tape together. When you read his letters, especially in chronological order, you hear him repeating the same thought uh, over and over again. And then if you can find good dating on poems, essays, books, and letters, and you read something from within the same two or three month period, it's remarkable how coherent Lewis's thinking mm -hmm. is in all of his writing. Um, and of course, I think we see it... Uh, in some ways, best of all in his career in, in these screw tape letters. So anyway, returning to my story. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew and I hijacked that. <laughs> Sister Penelope received the handwritten manuscript from Lewis. And after the war, she asked him what he wanted her to do with it. And he just told her to sell it. And she used the money to restore the convent's chapel. And the buyer was the New York Public Library, where the manuscript remained in relative obscurity. However, as Brenton Dickinson, a former guest of this show, likes to say, it would have cosmic significance. Mm. And the reason that that handwritten version is so important is that it differs from the version which you have in your book today. It not only has an extra paragraph, it does something else that's very important. 
it connects the Screwtape Letters to Lewis's sci-fi trilogy. So in the copy of your book, you'll see, I have no intention of explaining how the correspondence which I now offer to the public fell into my hands. In the handwritten version, he says, nothing will induce me to reveal how my friend Dr. Ransom got hold of the script which is translated in the following pages. Now, in this version of the preface, it's Lewis's protagonist from his science fiction trilogy, Professor Ransom, who discovers the letters. And Lewis is acting as like his publisher, which is something he does also in Out of the Silent Planet. And for those of you who haven't read that book, Professor Ransom, he discovers an interplanetary demonic conspiracy. And from this handwritten Screwtape preface, it seems that Lewis wants us to connect these letters to that conspiracy. He is drawing Screwtape into the world of Melacandra, Perilandra, and uh, this, this cosmic battle. And that just blew my mind when I first read about it uh, on, it was actually Brenton's blog, A Pilgrim in Narnia. And actually in the Skype session that's going to be attached to this episode, he and I talk about this a little bit more. But it, it really gets my mind going. Were there other connections that Lewis had in mind between his different books? Uh, for example, does the patient that we're going to follow throughout the Screwtip Letters, does he end up making an appearance in his superior book, that's even better than Until We Have Faces, The Great Divorce? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, done for the season. <laughs> nice to be with y'all. Thanks for the Shots microphone. Shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think that this is a fascinating idea for Lewis to kind of have this fictional frame narrator. Um, and the explanation, of course, is that perhaps the screw tape letters are written in old solar, which is the language of the angels and the language of the other planets. Uh, it's a language that we have forgotten, except in trace elements, according to Lewis's fictional character. Um, and, and this idea that there's this kind of unity to what's going on with all of these fantastic stories. I wish that he would have dropped a word in or made Dr. Ransom have the dream in The Great Divorce. And uh, maybe Dr. Ransom is, uh, his alias is Degree, Professor Degree Kirk. You know, um, <laughs> one could only wish that Lewis had kind of followed through with it. But I think it's a fascinating find. And Brenton's really uh, made a huge contribution uh, to the Lewis world by finding this. And, you know, I think there's endless possibilities. So that was the 42 preface. So now let's look at the longer preface from 1961. Uh, Andrew, can you, can you talk us through this, the, this, this preface that really answers many questions that people had and asked Lewis? Yeah, well, one of the, one of the most uh, enjoyable quotes that uh, <laughs> where you wonder what people are actually really reading or how much attention they're paying um, he says in the preface that a country clergyman wrote to the editor withdrawing his subscription on the ground to the editor of the guardian where screw tape was was published so this is a christian newspaper not a not the current uh, guardian newspaper but so this this country minister um says, uh, cancel my subscription because much ad of the advice given in these letters seems to him not only erroneous, but positively diabolical. <laughs> I love <laughs> so, that. I want to know which advice he didn't find <laughs> I know, diabolical. Right? <laughs> it reminds me of when you share an article from The Eye of the Tiber or Babylon B on Facebook mm -hmm. and one of your friends goes, mm -hmm. this is false. Fact check false. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, you... You didn't understand this, did you? <laughs> Isn't this a good example, though, Andrew, of what you were mentioning earlier of his laughter? I mean, right there, it's it's Lewis's humor. He is just so full of humor, self-deprecating humor, quite frankly, frequently. And you get that right there. Yeah. Well, Chesterton said that the reason why angels can fly is because they take themselves so lightly. Wow. And I think that this is one of the things... When Walter Hooper says that Lewis was the most thoroughly converted man he ever met, I think what you see in Lewis is this increasing humility and kind of uh, self-abandonment. And so I think that that becomes really fun once you don't take, your, take yourself so seriously. Um, so th that certainly is, is kind of showing up here in the, um, he's able certainly to laugh at himself. You know, Andrew, David knows this, but uh, he's got 20-something seasons planned out for the next 10 years of our life. But I also bought the rights <laughs> to Pints with Chesterton. <laughs> because <laughs> okay, great. when you quote Chesterton, I love Chesterton. You never know. You never know down the road what oh, could come of that. Sure. Absolutely. 
Well, you know, the 61 preface uh, goes on to talk about, well, Lewis says, if you gauge the amount of Bible reading in England by the number of Bibles sold, you would go far astray. Sales of the screw tape letters, in their own little way, suffer from a similar ambiguity. It is the sort of book that gets given to godchildren, the sort that gets read aloud at retreats. And there's a, some more self-deprecation. He also talks about the, the glorious humility of, I think, only once ever seeing somebody on the train actually reading one of his books. So he's, he's kind of taking the mickey out of himself, um, but uh, you can't... You, you can't underestimate the popularity of um, of this book. In typical British fashion, I heard one old um, uh, w- one old person once in England say, "Well, that was one of the books that you read." You see, <laughs> <laughs> it was expected. Yeah, and it was just everybody really knew of Screw Tape, and that's part of what we mentioned last week in the Time Magazine cover. Um, it landed on the cover of Time because. It was so widely popular and and part of regular, you know, public high school curriculum for many years. And he also tells the story of a student nurse who had read the screw tape letters because when she was interviewed, she was told that you had to have some hobbies. And the best thing to do was to say that you had read a book recently and they gave her a list and she chose screw tape, but only because it was the shortest. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Nevertheless, it's one of the most timeless books and and rereading it today really uh, really helps. I did some. I did the talkbacks, the kind of director's uh, Q and A after some of the performances for Screw Tape on stage that Max McLean's wonderful Fellowship for Performing Arts does. Uh, Brent Harris was starring in Screw Tape in Houston, and uh, that play, people would come up afterwards and say, "Oh, that sounds so contemporary. It sounds so fresh." And I said, "Well, that's because of the changes that they made in order to adapt it to a modern audi- audience." And they actually only changed two words, Max and FPA. They changed air raids to terrorist attacks. But everything else uh, in that play is straight from screw tape, and it's still, 80 years later, is speaking to us today. You know, I, I'll, say, I'll say it now because you were talking about how timeless it is. And when I was interviewing Douglas, we asked him the question of how to read this or what we should know. And since the listeners won't get this for a couple months after this, I'll just give his advice now. And I think it's so true because Dave and I were just recording uh, letter two prior to this. And Douglas's advice was read it through, put it down, come back and read it slowly then kind of one letter at a time. Mm. And there's so Mm -hmm. much truth to that because I read this, first of all, I read this about nine years ago, but I read it a few weeks ago in preparation for this more quickly through to remind myself of the letters. We had to determine logistically which letters we wanted to take I reread letter two and letter one just this morning in a very place of solitude, put myself into the moment, very present for it. And it was amazing what hit me when I wasn't reading it for the under, usually the first time you read a book, you're trying to just learn what it's saying. When you set that aside and try to absorb it and let it hit you, it takes on a whole other meaning. And so I strongly suggest people get away the first reading because you're just curious. You want to see what happens. You want to get to the ending. You want to, and then read it again and just don't care about having to get through it, but just take it in. Yeah, that's excellent advice. I taught this book for a number of years in high schools and colleges. And the mo- and I've also done it for adult ed, for Sunday school, Wednesday night um, groups. The most successful way of reading it, uh, in my experience as a teacher, is to read it out loud And to take it a bit at a time, maybe no more than a letter. And so um, I would have my students take a paragraph or two at a time. um, And and then we'd stop and ask the questions of it. And that was remarkable for me because although I've been reading these letters for years and years and years, it never failed. Every single time my students read it aloud and discussed it, I learned I learned loads of new things. And it's certainly, I've heard somebody say that Lewis bears careful reading. And, and repays um, careful reading and rereading. And you certainly see that here. Shall we talk about Lewis's belief in the devil? <laughs> Let's do it. But in this preface in 1961, uh, Lewis is asked, do you really believe in the devil? Um, and he says, now, if by the devil you mean a power opposite to God and like God, self-existent from all eternity, the answer is certainly no. There is no uncreated being except God. God has no opposite. No being could attain a perfect badness opposite to the perfect goodness of God. 
For when you have taken away every kind of good thing, intelligence, will, memory, energy, and existence itself, there would be nothing left of him. Now, this reminds me of, uh, of mere Christianity, right? Doesn't he talk about the devil? Um, I think he's, it's there. He says, do you mean at this day and age to bring, bring back our old devil, friend, the devil with all the horns and the, and the cape? And he says, what? I'm not all that particular about the horns, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then he makes this kind of Chestertonian move. I, well, I don't know what at this day and age has to do with it. Um, and uh, I love how he kind of unravels that. Do you see some echoes with mere Christianity too in this, David? Yes. I looked it up. It was in book two, chapter four. That's mm. where he speaks about dualism. And he refutes it in just the same way that he has refuted it just now by saying that you have to have good things first. And if you've got this purely evil thing, you have to get rid of all the good things. But even things like intelligence, will, and existence are mm -hmm. a good things. So there is no opposite to God. Absolutely. Well, and you can't succeid in being evil. Lewis says in Mere Christianity, um, evil can't succeed in being evil like good can succeed in being good. And part of his point, and I'm paraphrasing here, is success is a good thing. If evil were to succeed in being evil, then evil should fail at being evil. <laughs> and then pretty soon you have this kind of logical conundrum and it all unravels like a sweater. And it's what Matt and I have said repeatedly on, on this podcast, that evil isn't a thing. It's a privation. It's a twisting. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong degree. Mm -hmm. That's what evil is. It's not, it's not a substance in its own right. Yes, it's a perversion of something that's good. Doesn't he get that from Augustine? <laughs> yes, yes. It's definitely Augustinian. <laughs> the other rights I bought was Pints with Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> good. We have too many podcasts to do. <laughs> and not nearly enough pints. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but because of his very Augustinian outlook, he, he says that this is why the opposite of the, the devil isn't God, but Michael. So the, the archangel from Daniel 10 and Revelation 12. Mm -hmm. And even, uh, I mean, it, I think breaking down that kind of dualistic, you know, evil as being this equal and opposite power to God, um, it's like looking at the Balrog, who is of the same uh, race of things, order of things as Gandalf. And so mm -hmm. these are not ultimate demons, you know, who are opposed to God. And that's why I think that you guys are right, because The Great Divorce must be the very best book, because you can keep coming back to um, hell being a grain of sand on, uh, on, on the ground of heaven. Basically nothing. Yes. By the way, it's the best book to me because of one simple thing. There are two types of creatures, those that say to God, thy will be done, or to those who God says to whom thy will be done. And that, that line out of any Lewis line has impacted me more in my prayer life than any other line. Mm. That's why I love it. Oh. <laughs> They're amazing lines. No one who seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Mm. Um, and that book was, was transformative for me to see heaven as something that God will thrust on anyone who will sit still for it. It wasn't God's <laughs> trying to keep, keep it private. He's trying to force it on anybody uh, who will have it. Mm. So... But he can't force it on them. <laughs> no, no. We have to have to choose. Now, in that section about angels and demons, he says that it accords with the plain sense of scripture, Christian tradition, human tradition, and it doesn't conflict with science. But he says it wouldn't undermine his faith if it was shown to be false. And he says something very similar in God in the Dark, which I found kind of shocking. I'm lost. I'm sorry. Tell me more. Well, in, in, this, in this preface, he says that he believes in devils. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not part of his creed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just find that rather shocking because it, it definitely has pride of place within the Christian tradition. It does, but I think that there's something to Lewis where he's looking for the true thing. Um, and so the closer he gets to the true thing, the less the untrue thing uh, means. And uh, I wonder if there's a little bit of this kind of sense with Weston. And right before Weston slips down, Weston is the character in Paralander who's demon-possessed. Um, and mostly the demon speaks through Weston and Ransom tries to save him, even though Weston, you know, the demon possessed Weston is trying to kill Ransom. But at one point, Weston's feeble voice comes through and overpowers the, the, the devil's voice inside of him. And Ransom says, give me your hand. We will make it through. Say a child's prayer if you cannot say a man's. And so there's this thing in which the devil is really not as big as we make him up to be, or he makes himself up to be in our mind. He really is 
is just a scab on the face of everything good. Vivid. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis then goes on and talks about the depiction of spirits in art and literature. This I found really interesting. Yeah, he says, it's only the ignorant, uh, Di Dionysus says, it's only the ignorant who dream that spirits are really winged men. Um, and so, uh, and then you, I think that, the, don't you have an Ezekiel kind of these depictions of the spiritual beings, which are far, far beyond our, our capacity to see them. Hmm. They're all very strange. Yeah. Uh, and we want to, we want to anthropomorphize them, I think. Uh, and make them comfortable. Uh, mostly to fit in the Rolling Stones song, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think that if you really saw how hateful the devil was, there wouldn't be any sympathy for him at all. Quick curious question for both of you guys. How much do we know about angels and demons if you cut out tradition side of it? How much is said in scripture? Still a lot. Is there a lot? I mean, I, there, I, I just was curious. I'm, I don't know. I think it's maybe a third of the parables uh, deal with the enemy. Okay. Um, and, uh, but you have to read very carefully what, what Jesus actually says. You know, you think about hell. I grew up thinking, oh, hell is where you go if you do one fewer uh, good deed than bad deed. Um, <laughs> and Jesus said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. Hell was created for the enemy, for the spiritual creatures. Not for humans. And and Lewis says, you know, the gates of hell are locked, but they're locked from the inside. I love that statement when I heard Jerry Root say it. Well, and and all who go to go to hell choose mm -hmm. it. Uh, right? That isn't that from Great Divorce. Yep. Um, in that 61 preface too, he talks about the symbols of the devil, um, talks about how Frau Angelica's angels carry in their face and gesture the peace and authority of heaven. Um, when you compare that with the kind of chubby infantile nudes <laughs> of Raphael <laughs> and finally the soft, slim, girlish and consolatory angels of 19th century art shaped so feminine that they avoid being voluptuous only by their total insipidity. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the couple who gets off the bus, right? And you can't tell, uh, you can't tell what they are. That, that leave the line. Yeah. Exa okay. Yeah. Well, and this is why I asked that question was because of what he was saying right here, all of these different depictions, you would think we would have had a more unified depiction. Like I'm curious how it got so differing throughout time when yet I agree scripture's somewhat clear. And we talk a bit about it that I'm just so shocked that we get a chubby infantile or a winged creature or these other different, more feminine, just it shifts a lot. Well, he even says in scripture, the visitation of an angel is always alarming. Yeah. It has mm -hmm. to begin by saying, fear not. The Victorian angel looks as if it were going to say, there, there. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good dichotomy. <laughs> well, and there's also, though, this thing. Um, I think that, that PR is something that the enemy can be quite good at. And if the two great laws, the two great commandments are to love God and to love one another the entire spirituality of hell must be set up to stop us from loving God and stop us from loving each other. And one of the best ways that I can hate somebody is if I don't see them clearly, right? Mm. If I allow a caricature to be built up in my head. And so I think that maybe part of the spirituality of hell is just to teach us how to see things wrongly, how not to consider the fact that we live these days, but we are eternal creatures, that thousands and thousands and thousands of years await us um, in heaven, and we have 80 or 90 here. And so I think this constant perversion of what is true, and to twist our view of anything true, and to try to make it into some kind of caricature, I think that that's the work of the enemy. Now, I don't see a demon under every bush, but I think the enemy is trying to help us to not see clearly. And that to me is one of the great missions of Lewis is even by showing us these devils, he shows us what they're really like and how petty they are. And I can't wait till we get to the, uh, to the luncheon that, uh, that Screwtape en envisions for himself. <laughs> that could have been the perfect answer, Andrew, because it fits exactly with a later letter where he talks about Screwtape mentioning how we're going to use mainstream media back at that time to shape sexual preferences and cultures. I think you're spot on. That was, that was a great answer. If it, he is a PR agent and the devil is very good at that and he's doing it with him at home self as well in different times. Well, and that's one of the things that made Hitler so successful was his big PR guy. 
And Lewis, as a critic, when he's going through the depictions of spirits in literature, he goes through Dante, Milton, and is it pronounced Goethe? I've only ever seen it written. Goethe. Okay. So he criticizes Goethe for making the devils humorous and making the point that humor involves a sense of proportion and the ability to see yourself from the outside. Mm-hmm. And he makes the point there is none of that in hell. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the subtle PR campaign has been going on throughout the history of literature. And Lewis is going to do his best to try and remedy it. And he even talks about how our personal preferences or, or what we regard as good and bad, that is, that's, those are the symbols that we use. Because he says, I like bats much better than I like bu- bureaucrats. So rather than having his devils with bat-like wings, he, he puts them in a, a nice bureaucratic office building. <laughs> and that's why his symbol for hell is something like a bureaucracy of a police state or the offices of a thoroughly nasty business concern. And it's it's what you see in that hideous strength, which he writes a couple of years later. Actually, I think he finishes it in 43. Um, and so you certainly see that. Yeah, Lewis has got these great perspectives. He says, uh, I think it's in, in Mere Christianity, where he says, of course, it is uh, it is likely better to be a, a prostitute than a cold-hearted prig. But of course, it is better to be neither. <laughs> and isn't he taking that a little bit from Chesterton where he's... No, maybe not. But isn't Chesterton that says the person in the broth of the prostitute might be... I would say he's taking it from Jesus when he says that, uh, that prostitutes and tax collectors are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you Pharisees. I, I'm bummed I can't remember the full quote, but it was almost like they might be closer to heaven than we think. I think that you're probably right. Um, I would not be surprised at all. And Lewis is constantly remembering and uh, and quoting things. The, the for me one of the, the one of the best tools comes from experimenting criticism, where Lewis says, "What you see depends a great deal upon where you stand, and it also depends on what sort of person you are." I think that's the magician's nephew. Oh, you know what? You're absolutely right. Um, experiment and criticism uh, is where he says, I must see with other eyes. My own eyes are not enough enough for me. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, David. But that that question of perspective and what the what the enemy is trying to get us to do is to see everything wrong, um, is to is to twist our perception on on everything. And that you can see Wormwood and Screwtape really hard at work in some of those things. And I got to do my little clarification. I was close. The quote is, every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. So it wasn't that they're necessarily closer to God, but they are okay. searching for God. They're looking for God, obviously in the wrong way, to the wrong degree. <laughs> but that was the yep. quote. Well, and fundamentally, I mean, a self, a, a, a cold-hearted prig and a, and a self-centered businessman wants to aggrandize himself. At least somebody looking for a prostitute as horrible, and I'm not justifying that sin in any way, but it involves some kind of uh, twisted and fallen form of reaching outward towards another. Mm. And this reaching outward towards another followed faithfully will become true love. Reaching inward will only become self, and that will leave you in the gray town or worse for the rest of your life and uh, with company like Screwtape who just want to eat you alive. And am I correct that Jerry Root points out that it, Screwtape is so much about turning within, not going out to the other people, but to stop it of becoming more that self-aggrandizing, self-referential is the word actually I believe he used in one of his lectures? Absolutely. I think the opposite of love is self. It's not hatred itself. It's me. Um, I think fundamentally the, the, the best word that we can say in the universe is thou when we say it to God. Mm. When I say not me, but you, right? When I turn from myself and turn to God, when I turn from myself and I prefer someone else, when I favor someone else, um, that's the fundamental move that leads towards love because love turns outer. Um, and and selfishness, the great sin of pride, turns inward. And yeah, Jerry's absolutely right about that. It's as we kept saying in The Great Divorce, you know, Lewis's <laughs> best book. Uh, in Cavatus in Se, the soul turned in on itself. That's what we see in these ghosts. And that's how Lewis can describe hell as the worst. It's, it's a dog-eat-dog principle of organization because everybody is focused on themselves, mm-hmm. on, on, their, on their own advancement, and hell, and to, quite literally, to hell with everyone else. 
Well, to resolve this argument, Lewis said that... <laughs> <laughs> it's far and away my best book. Yeah, we know. <laughs> and much my best book. But the, I think that part of the reason that it is his best w- book, if it is, is because it really takes that that scene with, with Michael and Pam, and it takes a lot of what he started out by doing in The Great Divorce, and it really pushes it all the way to the finish. And Part of what makes To We Have Faces great, if it is, is because it really not only quotes all of Lewis's books, but The Great Divorce it really features very prominently. And I think what he started doing in the 40s uh, in The Great Divorce, he finishes uh, in To We Have Faces. There are lots and lots of echoes, and that's part of what makes it so fetching. I love how we have certain things of each season, David, that take hold and take root, like incredible or pinking the brain i think we've got our first one for season four it's the great divorce till we have faces battle smackdown <laughs> we're going to constantly reference it yes well you can continue being the mice nibbling about at my feet <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, we got a worthy opponent i like it bring it <laughs> well back to the preface well and we were talking about perspective and in that 61 uh 61 preface, he says, the book's purpose was not to speculate about diabolical life, but to throw light from a new angle on the life of men. And light is a crucial word for Lewis because he names his favorite character Lucid, Lucy, which is the Latin for light. He really wants us to see clearly. Um, and I think that's the main kind of Lewis's kind of main goal. And that's that's part of why he writes screw tape letters. And Part of why he corrects some of the misapprehensions and, and misunderstandings in 61. And I've, I've mentioned with David on a recording before, this, the, the holding up of a mirror, a self-mirror. We saw that in, with Orwell until we have faces. This feels like that. When you're reading every letter, it's like a mirror in your face. And it's it just reflects back at you, your own brokenness, your own heart, your own sinfulness, all of this stuff. I mean, I think the screw tape letter does that so beautifully. And it's kind of related to what you just said with the light. Light is illuminating. Uh, and that's what's happening when I read the screw tape letters. It's illuminating, honestly, brokenness and temptations and sin and the way Satan's working in my heart and in my life. Well, and mirrors are crucial. Um, paying attention to what happens in mirrors in Lewis is a really great way to tie a lot of the themes throughout his writings together. Of course, you see Eustace, who looks into the mirror of the pool and realizes that he's become a horrific dragon. And people often uh, ask me, why does, how does Lewis know me so well? And I answer somewhat facetiously, well, I've spent the night in his bedroom and there's a piece of furniture in there that fully explains why he does it. It's a mirror. (laughs) Now, there was a wardrobe in there, but I think Lewis really is willing to look at his own short-sightedness and and sinfulness. Uh, In Letters to Malcolm, he says, language is too weak to describe the weakness of my spiritual condition. Um, In fact, I would turn it down like the gas almost until the flame goes out to find language weak enough to describe how weak I am. And here's this kind of 20th century spiritual titan, yet he really knew how sinful he was. And I think, don't you see that in St. John of the Cross and in Teresa of Avila and Teresa of Lisieux? And don't you see it in all the great saints? The closer they get to God, the more they have a sense of their own own lack of self-worth. Whereas you see Screwtape, this mid-level manager in a bureaucracy, looming large in his own mind all the time. I absolutely love that. I'm experiencing that right now in my life. <laughs> I know my weakness. <laughs> and Lewis even says in this preface, some have paid me the undeserved compliment by supposing that my letters were the ripe fruit of many years' study of moral and ascetic theology. They forgot <laughs> there is an equally reliable, though less creditable, way of learning how temptation works. Mm-hmm. And then here he quotes Psalm 36. He says, my heart, I need no others, showeth me the wickedness of the ungodly. <laughs> he had looked inside and he knew how he was repeatedly duped. And he was willing to do that and willing to make changes. Um, There's the story told of him coming in from a walk and recounting uh, what he saw to Warney and talking about seeing a farmer lying down by his field. And as he's telling the story, Lewis jumps up and says, oh, I have committed a sin against charity. And he goes back and he brings the farmer in and he helps revive him and restore him uh, to health. And this kind of constant willingness to examine his life and to do better. Um, Walter Hooper told me that Lewis's motto was, when in doubt, give more. 
and when in doubt, answer that letter. And this this kind of willingness to see myself and to change, that's to me even more than his writings. That's to me the example that I want to follow in my own life from Lewis. I think that we all need to to kind of be honest with ourselves. In some ways, this this book holds up an uncomfortable mirror in front of all of us. And in this preface, we find out a little bit more about the the mechanism that he's using to hold up this mirror to us, the, these diabolical letters. We find out that he had actually read other devil letters. Lewis wasn't the first person to try using this, uh, but I think it's fair to say he was probably the most successful. And he explains how he comes up with the devil names. And it's it's really the sounds of the words. So with screw tape, he says, I, I fancy the words, you know, Scrooge and screw and thumbscrew and tapeworm and red tape. That's how he came up with with all of these names. And it was so popular that people kept on wanting him to write sequels. But he explains that while he wrote nothing more easily than these, he didn't enjoy doing it. And he says, because he had to get into that diabolical attitude and he says it's not fun like he described it as a spiritual cramp he said when i had to speak through screw tape it was all dust grit thirst and itch every trace of beauty freshness and geniality had to be excluded it almost smothered me before i was done it would have smothered my readers if i prolonged it and i I was reading a biography and George Sayre, he says that it was about this time that Lewis began receiving spiritual direction from the Cowley fathers. So I think the, this experience of writing screw tape made Lewis really take his spiritual life to the next level more seriously as he was having to enter into this diabolical uh, way of thinking. I love what you, what you read. That's, a, that's a, a favorite quote. And I love how he prefaces it. He says, I, I had never written anything more easily. And he said it's, and when people asked him to write a sequel of Letters from an Angel, he said, I'm just, I'm not the man to do it because it was very easy for me to write like a man much worse than me. I just had to stop doing those good things that I was doing and, you know, and indulge in those things that I knew that I shouldn't be. And so it was fairly easy for him to kind of slip into that. Yeah, that dust grit thing thirst and itch, the spiritual cramp. Um, and in, in many ways, I think he was doing spiritual duty and paying a spiritual price for writing these letters. And he knew, I think, what it would do. I think that he knew once he published them that it would just torpedo his career. And that's kind of what it did. Uh, nevertheless, he did it. And then he gave away the money that he made from it. And so I think that uh, the fact that we're still talking about it almost 80 years on is <laughs> is a testament to to how he did it and why he couldn't write anymore. I also wonder what spiritual battles he had to go through writing these. I have witnessed so much in so small of ways, people who are coming closer to Christ and things come up in their life that of Satan, clearly Satan driven, that are trying to prevent them from receiving Christ or growing closer in Christ or that encounter. And Lewis right now is probably writing one of the more profound books that's about to illuminate the ways that Satan works in this world. Do you really think he's going to sit back and do nothing to Lewis in this time period? I have to imagine a spiritual warfare that went on in this period as he's getting into this. And he even says that he felt, di- I mean, he didn't say felt diabolic, but he, it was really hard for him to write these in that sense. And it was draining. And I think of Heath Ledger with the Joker in the dark Knight. He almost like took on the role too much where mm-hmm. it was, it was tough for him. And so I, I applaud Lewis for doing this and hopefully the grace that God provided him to get through it because this is a powerful book against Satan's tools. As the Lord always does, he provides grace and help. And as Andrew just mentioned, that there's this desire to produce the, the, the mirror of the screw tape letters, uh, the angelic letters that Lewis tried to write and just decided he wasn't a good enough writer. And we're actually going to be having Charlie Starr on the show later this season to talk about the Archangel Fragment, mm-hmm. where we actually have a section of what Lewis was trying to do to write from the other side. As he says in, in this preface, it, it, it's so difficult because every sentence would have to smell of heaven. <laughs> and who could s- scale the spiritual heights required and who could write in the answerably heavenly style? Um, yeah. And he's already trying to write as well as he can. You know, you're, you, what you just said, Matt, made me think of something I'd never really kind of considered before. 
the spiritual implications of seeing Hitler and having Warney go off to war, and by now he's in the Home Guard, and there are blackout curtains, and London is being bombed, and how dark that period must have been spiritually for them. We do know that in response to seeing the German planes fly over England, um, Virginia Woolf put rocks in her dress and walked into the walked into the river and drowned herself. She couldn't face another world war. Mm. And this kind of invasion of evil, especially this self-deceptive evil um, and this intentionally deceptive evil, as Lewis talks about in the inspiration of listening to Hitler, I mean, and then Warney goes off to war and he's working home guard. At this point, he takes his service revolver from World War I and he throws it into the river because he wouldn't want to be caught by any Germans with arms and given them reason to kill him. I mean, war was this kind of, and death were his constant companions. And so maybe in some ways, the screw tape letters allowed him to, uh, to do a little propaganda um, for the Lord and to work out some of that darkness. And, um, Somebody, oh, I forget who it was. Um, I'll have to look it up. Somebody's recently discovered a couple of propaganda albums that Lewis recorded for the BBC. Have you guys heard about this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're albums where he's talking about Siegfried and Norse myth and how uh, Germany is not a good recipient of the of the, the 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 legacy of Norse myth. And so these are he's making propaganda tools for the the British government. As far as I know, only side two and four of these two records, one and three, or one and three, two and four, uh, only side two and four remain. Um, but it's Lewis's voice uh, doing propaganda. And in some ways, this is Lewis maybe doing war effort like he's doing moral uplift in mere Christianity on the BBC. He's also saying, here's what the enemy looks like, and the enemy is a lot closer to home than over there in Germany. And that's, I think, part of what led to the smash popularity of the Screw Tape Letters. Wow. And that was why everyone wanted sequels, which he refused to do, uh, <laughs> until he eventually wrote Screw Tape Proposes a Toast for the American magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, which we are going to discuss once we've finished the Screw Tape Letters. Oh, can't wait. So that was pretty much the preface from the 60s. And we're running a little long, so I'm going to suggest, because there are actually some other prefaces that Andrew, in his library of all things Lewis, actually has. I'm going to suggest that you do that as a Skype session, so you can actually show people the covers sure. uh, of all of these all, all of these different versions of Screwtape, of which there are several, that I never knew existed. Yes, and I don't even have them all. Um, but I've been <laughs> in touch with um, C.S. Lewis Editions, uh, Jeremy Gordon, uh, and I'm taking some pictures of some of the things in my collection so he can add them to his fantastic website, uh, C.S. Lewis Editions, The Disordered Image. I do want to say that um, I actually have seen the manuscript that Lewis gave to Sister Penelope. And uh, he instructed her, uh, he said, if you can persuade any sucker, as the Americans say, to buy the manuscript of screw tape, pray do and use the money for any pious or charitable object you you like. Did it ever occur to you that the replacement of old scrawl of scrawled old manuscript by the clear printed book in mint condition is a pretty symbol of resurrection? Uh, in a letter he <laughs> wrote to, to Sister Penelope. Well, the uh, the rich sucker who bought the manuscript was the New York Public Library. And I did a research fellowship at the, at the library one summer and got permission one day to go up to the Berg collection. And they brought out the actual manuscript of the screw tape letters. It's about a page and a half of uh, 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 two and a half pages or so, a page and a verso, and then another half a page. And you can see Lewis's own handwriting. And I've got some scratch outs and and uh, there's a when we get to one of the later letters, there's a really important omission that Lewis makes. And so I've shared that document of, of my transcriptions with David and Matt, and we'll talk about some of those uh, important things. You can even see Lewis's pipe smudge and his teacup stain <laughs> on the actual pages. So if you're if, when the New York Public Library opens up again, you can go up to the Bird Collection on the third floor and have a look for yourself. I love it. <laughs> so as we wrap up, I was just going to offer two suggestions for unscrewing screw tape. Uh, and they're just drawn from the shorter preface from 1942. Develop prudence with regards to your interest in the devils. Don't think too much, don't think too little. But lastly, don't trust anything, he says. <laughs> That's what I had. Screw tape's the liar. 
wishful thinking, and all screw tape and worm mode care about are consuming souls at all costs. Well, and I think that perhaps uh, one other thing about unscrewing screw tape is to realize that what he's doing is laughable. He will lose in the end. He has lost from the beginning. And when you realize, uh, as David keeps reminding us, uh, that greater is he who is within us than he who is within the world. Jesus said, you should fear the one who can throw the body into hell. And the one who can throw the body into hell is God, right? And the only one who deserves our fear is God. But by fear, he means our deep respect. And once we are safe in his hands, um, we are safe from his enemy. And, and listeners, that's, there's not a better way to end than on that note. And I want to say too, because listeners, you guys are getting very familiar with Andrew uh, now because you listen to the preface. And Andrew, I just want to say, obviously, thank you for joining us for this season. I can say this is the first episode we really dove into something. The last one was more of a welcome to the season. And I have been edified hearing your contributions to this. You, The things that you say, you very much bring them to the heart and to our own spiritual journey. And I as I was listening to you, I was like, man, this is really hitting me. Yeah, I need to hear that. And so ironically, mm. usually when you're giving these, you've already had the hitting happening and you're prepping for it. And now you're just communicating <laughs> it. But hearing you, it's just been a blessing. So I'm excited for the season. The listeners, I hope you got a good taste of the incredible value that Andrew brings to uh, this season. And we're just so excited. So Andrew, thank you for joining us too. He used to say nice things like that about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, <laughs> I was going to thank you for that, but but really none of this would be possible if David weren't kind of loading up our carts and oftentimes yes. carrying for us. And so uh, I so appreciate the, the huge, vast amounts of work, David, that you have done yep. in order to set the table for us to do what we do. And where we fall down, you've you know, gone behind and before us. And so if you could, should see the screen notes uh, there, it, David has done such a great job. I'm also, we're finishing this on a Sunday evening and I spent my first Sunday is in my field ed, in my parish, um, working in a church that was entirely empty. And so we did our mass and it's a joy to continue my Sunday morning ministry uh, here because Lewis has helped me become a, a thoughtful yeah, Christian, and I owe him, as he said, of his own master, I owe him almost as great a debt as one man can can owe any other. And so the invitation to come and join with you all, it's so much fun. And I love the <laughs> laughter that we have. And and I love exploring the the things that are the greatest things in in my life uh, with you too. So it's it's just a delight for me. I love it. And listeners, you can join in with us also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, and you can also purchase really cool pints of jack materials glasses t-shirts check out andrew's ebay there'll be a link in the show notes as well as on the main website where he is selling secondhand books of all kinds and prices and i've been waiting till the beginning of the season to trump out some of my good stuff i've gotten some uh some first editions of uh, some of the narnia books and uh so i have some nice treats so by the time this podcast airs i'm holding off some of those so that uh that y'all can share in them too. I love it. And as a reminder, we don't we don't like to push this too much, but if you guys feel called to, or if you want to join our Slack community, the Patreon, it makes this possible. We are upping the amount of episodes, six, seven, eight a month, probably going out with the after hours. And uh, you guys have been phenomenal supporting that. And the, Pat the uh, Slack community is just going gangbusters. I was talking to David before this, and I mean, the amount of messages going back and forth each day are incredible. They're inspiring. They lift me up. I feel so blessed to have the listeners a part of that. So if you support us at the $5 level, you get access to that the Slack community. So if you feel called to do that. Um, but with all that said, we most importantly just ask that you join us next time with your time when we will be going further up and further in. Cheers. 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 Cheers.